Hi, everyone. Really, really excited for this session. Uh, my name is Rodolfo. I'm, as Oli said, one of his PhD students, fortunate PhD students, um, in human AI creative collaboration, really looking at how humans and AI can interact in creative activities. So the focus of this session is precisely uh, that link between humans and AI. And what does that mean? You know, what does it mean for humans to interact with AI? And how do we do it in a way that's effective, that is socially desirable, fun as well, productive, etc. So we have uh, four speakers who all will bring different perspectives on this question. The first speaker is a fellow Latin American, <laughs> Teresa, Teresa in Australian. Um, and she, she's from Monash. Her research focuses precisely on, on human AI creative collaboration. She, she's a lecturer and member of Sensi Lab at Monash University. She holds a computer engineering um, bachelor's degree from Columbia and also has a master's in software engineering. And the research is really focusing on applying tools and techniques from different areas of AI to enable software systems to become creative collaborations, creative collaborators rather than just tools in a creative process. Uh, so her research interests include co-creative systems, generative systems, explainable AI, natural language processing, and creative aspects of formal methods. So she will be um, sharing with us a, a presentation on collaborating with AI. And with that, I'll just leave you with Teresa. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rodolfo, for the presentation. So yeah, today I'm going to be talking about collaborating with AI and what, um, what that means um, or could mean. And this is, I want to say, this is joint work with a lot of people. And one of them is Stephen, who is a PhD student also from Monash. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge that. So yeah, this is uh, an article I was reading uh, in the Medium. Um, it really caught my attention because of the title. It said, a collaborative effort between GPT-3, Midjourney, and myself. And myself is himself, uh, Alberto Romero, who was the, the writer of the article. So what he did was to collaborate with GPT-3 and Midjourney to uh, by taking a famous painting, in this case, uh, The Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh, and trying to basically recreate it by using GPT-3 and, and Midjourney. And, and this is uh, the result in, in the right. <clears throat> so basically, how is the flow here? So the, the, um, the author uh, input a prompt into GPT-3 saying, describe with visual details the starry night by Vincent van Gogh in one paragraph. So that was the whole prompt that he entered into GPT-3. And GPT-3 basically provided a description of, of that uh, art piece. So the painting is set at night with a bright moon in the sky. The stars are shining brightly, and the landscape is bathed in a blue light. The trees and houses in the distance are silhouetted against the sky, and the whole scene has a peaceful dream-like quality. So it's quite a, a good explanation, uh, capturing a lot of details from the painting. Um, and then he took that and basically converted into a prompt uh, to give to Midjourney to generate basically the, the recreation, let's say, of the painting. And he added some elements like the medium and the, the style of the, of the painting and the ratio aspect so that it could be a bit, uh, you know, comparable. And, and this is <clears throat> the, the result, right, from my journey. And he did that with different, different paintings as of here. Are some examples of the paintings that, that he used. But so as expected, um, a lot of people started talking about it. And, and there were people that were you know, completely amazed about the results. There were people that started the debate about, you know, this is taking people's jobs. And you know, what about the creativity of the artist? But one that really caught my attention, because it's really close to, 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 my, to my work, is this, this coming from a reader. I don't think you collaborated with anything. You used a, power por a powerful tool, but it was all you. GPT-3 and Midjourney are both very sophisticated, but there is no volition and no creativity in them. It's just mixing things it has seen before. I don't think you can collaborate with Midjourney any more than you, ca that you could collaborate with a camera. So this, this really um, brings back to what um, you were saying in, the, in your talk about this Models being, we, let's not forget that they are these statistics, basically. So they are not really being creative per se. They are, they are, you know, being very good, and they are very good now, and, and, and becoming even better at predicting. But 
are they actually collaborating with us? No. I, I, and my personal opinion is not really. They are very good tools to use that we can use, but, but they really cut short in the idea of collaboration. So talking to artists uh, about this and the experiences that I've had with you know, people working with uh, these different technologies, they really feel, feel frustrated because they can't take the technology further. Like they, they may like something that, the, that the, these technologies have uh, generated, but it's not there yet. And they want to you know, evolve the, the, the concepts that are there, but it's not, there is no way to, to tell in it. Even if, if you use, for instance, Dali, um, and you like something, but you want, you know, there is something in one image that you really like, you can ask for variations of it. And the variations are not really very good, and it's not, it doesn't really go far from actually the original image that you are taking, so it's like, you, and you cannot really interact, interact with it and collaborate. So, but uh, again, talking uh, about the experiences, a lot of people and artists and creative practitioners talk about it, about the collaboration more as a control thing rather than the collaboration. And thinking about that is, okay, what is the point if, let's say, we can really control everything that, that these technologies is? So, so what is the point of having these technologies that are so powerful and that they have so much potential, but if we are going to restrict it so much that, that we cannot, you know, have those surprises and, 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 you know, that innovation that it can come with it. So when I think about collaboration, one thing, and there are many aspects of collaboration that are important, but one thing that, that is really um, important to me and, and to my research is communication. So we, when we create in a, in a team, we communicate, right? We exchange ideas, um, we challenge each other, there is conflict, there are different things that go on in that communication. So that part is really important. So one aspect of communication is explanations. And maybe a lot of you or, or some of you know about the field of explainable AI, and there, there has been you know, mentions already about that here, like, you know, trust. And the idea of explainable AI is to make those black box systems more transparent, right? So that we can, or people that use them can understand how they work and, and then we can increase trust in their use. So explainable AI is very important in the field for that, right? But what does it mean? What is the role of explainability in creativity? <clears throat> so that is what I'm really interested about. So there is a concept that I put forward that is explainable computational creativity. So the idea of, you know, when we are exchanging explanations, because we do that a lot in when we are working together, how do we do it and what is the idea of that? So it's more about uh, not only understanding our, you know, our way of thinking, but it goes further. It's about relieving, revealing the value of our ideas. It's about championing the, that as well. It's about uh, being able to enter into this dialogue. And, and being able to create together. So um, looking into that, uh, we, we wanted to do a pilot aside with GPT-3, and this was the work done, some of the work done with Stephen. And so we, we, we want to look into these ideas in different, in different domains. And we started with a very difficult one, I have to say, the, that is music. So we uh, try to see, okay, we, we want to test the capabilities of, of current uh, state-of-the-art systems, so in this case, GPT-3. What happens if we give GPT-3 uh, a string representation of a piece uh, of music, and then we ask, you know, to explain, you know, what, what was going on there. So we, uh, we provided a prompt, we provided, uh, as you can see in the, in the previous, previous slide, um, so we provided some so uh, we divided uh, uh, the song. We use music ABC notation and divided it into different sections. And we started in the prompt. Basically, we talk a bit about the, the sessions, about the, the idea of the song. So there was a little bit of guidance there for GPT-3. And then we ask, how did you convey young love in your songs? That's one of the things that it was in the prompt. And GPT-3 GPT said, I decided to use simple melodies with little technical difficulty. I did this because young love is about simplicity and straightforwardness, hence why the key signature of my song was C major, which has no sharps or flats. So in this case, GPT-3 performed pretty well. 
it was very coherent in what he said, and it actually connected to what the, the, the idea of, of the song was. And then we asked, can you describe your musical decisions for section three? And said, I decided to keep the mood of section three lighter so it would contrast with section two. I also decided to use staccato notes to create a bouncer melody. So in here, the composer, which was Steve N, um, said, no, this is wrong. Uh, in section three, section three is actually a repeat of the melody of section two, but in a higher octave. So in this case, GPT-3, as expected, uh, uh, didn't really uh, perform well because it doesn't really understand, right, what is, what is going on in there. So it's, it's just trying to uh, play very well. So from this, uh, one thing that, that, that we thought is, okay, we need to be able to, to uh, understand how people communicate during the creative process. That is a, that's one of the important things as well about this, and this comes a lot about what Angie was talking yesterday about understanding cultural practices and what that means for the use of AI. And, and this is related to that. So we want to understand how people communicate, what are the kind of explanations that they, that they use and how they interact in this creative collaboration so that we can maybe take some of that and try to understand what, does it, that, what it means for human AI collaboration. So we have a first study that we are running, and this is all work in progress. Uh, so we're running this first study that is about understanding interactions with creative systems. And we have a very simple music system that is um, using a Markov, Markov chain model, actually. Uh, and we ask musicians with different backgrounds to improvise with this system. And, uh, and we ask them after that to tag their performances and basically telling us when they would have liked to have some kind of communication with the system, either because they wanted to communicate something to the system to take it in one direction or something, or because they wanted to understand some, something from the system. And we conducted uh, some semi-structured interviews from that. So for this, we use a tool called Music Circle in which um, you, can, you can have some, um, you can upload your you know, performances and, and, and can be annotated. And there were, I mean, there were very nice uh, comments and, and we started, we have started seeing how people actually really in a specific moments want the, to have this kind of, of collaboration and, and this kind of communication and that, that is important for them to understand. Like there were moments in which they really didn't understand why the system was doing something so they wanted to, to, to have, to understand that. In the second study, um, we are, looking at understanding how people explain their own creative process. So this is more about, we ask musicians to compose a piece, as a short piece, and we ask them to annotate it with their explanations of, um, you know, any kinds of explanations of why, the, of the musical decisions, basically. So um, we've had people doing this, again, musicians with different backgrounds, and there have been very nice things, like for instance, uh, here, one of the participants said, I decided to experiment with indeterminate ways of writing music uh, by creating an alphabet matrix of, uh, and assigning each letter of the alphabet to a semitone in a snake and ladder fashion. Using this, I then match each letter in the sentence that I wrote. Uh, it was a sentence that, that she, she wrote there. As it crumbles, as it fades, as it turns out to those, and then, to the relevant note and strung these together to form the melody. So she had in her mind, and, and, and there are a lot of exp uh, explanations about uh, this song and the piece, this piece of music, but in the general uh, theme of the, of the song, the participant had this idea of uh, being new in Australia and uh, one day seeing the sunset through the window and it just inspired, inspired, inspired her to do this and then it made the, the decisions from this. So you can start seeing, or like we know, that people you know, draw from different experiences and different ways as well to, to do their creative, their creative processes. And here there is another one. This section adds as an echo of the final notes of the previous section. It aims to implicitly convey a sense of fading away without changing dynamics. So there are also something that we have noticed is that some 
uh, musicians use more of um, a technical, let's say, language to do their explanations, but others are more like kind of in a maybe romantic way or of what is going on in like in, a, in their emotions. So there are there are very nice differences there. There is a third study that we haven't started yet, but it's something that we're going to do, and is to understand how people explain it, explain each other when when they are actually composing together. So here is when we are starting to, to go into the idea of co-creation and co-creation settings. So how, what are the kind of explanations? When are they used? When are they, um, and how is the reception and, and, and these things? So yeah, what we want to do with this, uh, with the different styles is to really understand, understand how people first, how people communicate, what kind of different um, strategies uh, do they use and how we can do it in, in maybe in a, in, in a machine setting, a human AI setting, and with different uh, aids. So when we talk about this, it's not only about natural, natural language, but also about maybe visual communication and different things, uh, which aspects of the creative process should the explanation be focusing on. And, in, and this will be also different in different domains, and also different for different types of users. When should the system intervene? How do we evaluate the effectiveness of the interventions and also what ethical issues arise with this kind of uh, interactions? And of, or, or I think there will be a lot more questions to, to solve with this. But so my take uh, with this and, and the idea of our work, what we want to, to, to focus on is there are a lot of advantages, advantages uh, and, uh, of using technology at the moment. And the advances are impressive, and they are impacting the world uh, of creative industries and, and the creative practitioners, uh, and in different domains. But so how can we better exploit that? And for us, there is a lot in the heart of, of how can we better exploit it is that the idea of co-creation, of co-creation and understanding how, that, how we can push more the, the, the boundaries. I, I remember seeing the, the demo yesterday of Ben, that he had the loop. You do the how in the loop, and I think one of the prompts was the monkey, a monkey that had a, with a banana, eating a banana, and then you know it started shifting, and at, suddenly it appeared a monkey, something a monkey with a blue shirt, or a monkey sitting in a chair. So how? And we thought somebody said, how did that happen? How? How? And what is the link? So we really need to understand more about how these things are working. And also, is there some kind of value there? That's, I think, the next step uh, in, in using these technologies and how these technologies should work. And is OK, you are, in some way, bringing a blue chair or a chair with a monkey eating a banana. Why? Why is that valuable in this setting? There is a connection there, obviously, that, that GPT-3 and um, the, the algorithms that you were using detected, but is it actually relevant for this? So I think that is something that really uh, uh, focuses on that. And the other thing is, as uh, Caroline and Katini was talking, were talking yesterday, having the user, you know, t talking with the user and actually uh, thinking about their needs and what they and what they really need with this. And just as the last thing, um, an advertisement very quickly, uh, with uh, people in Sensei Lab, we are uh, going to, to host a, a workshop in Italy Prato in June next year. And so we just want to invite you all to, to, to this. And the idea here is to talk about co-creation, uh, maybe do some hands-on work as well. Uh, it will be one week uh, in Prato. There will be gelato. Nice. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you're interested, please send us a, send me an email, or uh, there is also the, the website there. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Teresa. I think all of that is going straight into my thesis as references. <laughs> um, and I think it's really interesting how you talked about languages as the thing that's really tying humans and AI, and just going back to the idea of language that we talked about yesterday. Um, so I think you know beyond this interaction between creators and AI, there's also another agent involved, or another, not agent, but another person, uh, which is the audience, right? So I think the next talk uh, really will kind of illuminate a little bit on that uh, with Arul Baskaran, who is a strategic lead with the ABC Innovation Lab. 
a team that focuses on future audience needs and challenges and opportunities for the ABC. The Innovation Lab uses research, design, and experimentation to develop new content formats, distribution methods, and product offerings. And in prior roles, Arul was responsible for digital engagement at the Powerhouse Museum and helped develop ABC's iView streaming service. Um, Arul completed his MA at the Annenberg School for Communications at the University of Pennsylvania and is an adjunct professor with the UNSW iCinema team with a focus on immersive AR and VR experiences. So thank you so much, Arul, for being here. Um, and I'll just leave you with him. Morning, everyone. It's really good to be here. Really good to hear the perspectives from Teresa, from Canva team, NVIDIA, and CSIRO as well. So while we get started, so um, yeah, I'm Arul. I work at the ABC. The Innovation Lab is a small cross-disciplinary team, and we work within um, the strategy department of the ABC. So a little bit separated from television and radio, but the idea is that we, um, we can run um, pilots and prototypes and experiments, move fairly quickly, and come back and return some findings, um, especially on areas of new opportunity or new challenges. So it's about, we're working in the kind of 24-month um, kind of framework. Um, and uh, the results of our pilots then inform our strategy going forward. So, um, and we've got a few different um, themes that we're working on very broadly. Uh, these are the themes that, that we're piloting around in the next two years. First one, you know, it's COVID and working and living remotely, and that's changing um, entertainment as well and the way that people are consuming media, obviously, and education, which we all have um, some role in. Uh, the expanding gap, perennial ABC um, challenge, how do we reach younger people? Um, it's getting even harder these days. Um, and the next two, modular content um, and harnessing the algorithm, especially, are more around AI and ML and how we apply them within the ABC. So I'm just going to focus on that for the minute. And um, it's worth saying that not a lot of people thinking about this actively at the ABC. You know, there's a lot of people doing lots of things, um, especially around journalism and creating content. But AI and ML is often um, you know, something that we should think about in the future, and you know, we'll get to it eventually, that sort of thing. So, Part of our job, part of my job, is to start that conversation. And I start by um, just recognizing the role that AI and ML already play in our lives. So for this room, it's probably not necessary, but showing them that you know, every day things that we work with, like Google Maps, um, is using AI and ML. Um, when your phone recommends making an album, it's using you know, facial recognition um, to put that together. So um, we need to understand these technologies in order to use them, in order to stay competitive, for sure. We're working in a, a competitive landscape. You know, Netflix, um, everyone else with really big pockets and research teams is competing for the same attention that we're competing for. So we need to do it for that reason. But there's another really important reason, which is that as journalists, if we don't understand what's happening behind um, this kind of black box of decision making that's increasingly affecting, you know, every aspect of our life, from education, healthcare, whether you get a bank loan or not, you can't effectively do your job of making sense of the world for the audiences that we work with. So it's incumbent on us to understand this a bit more. So there's about three different areas, I would say, that we focus on. The first is like metadata and classification and kind of parsing all of the content that we're putting out, right? So really powerful tools around um, um, just tagging, um, image recognition, transcription, captioning, um, and then presenting back content to the right person at the right time on the right device. So AI ML runs through all of that. Um, we're using um, AI and ML at the moment to retrospectively go through thousands of hours of our archive and tag content in a way that's more usable. So that's happening. We're also using it to transcribe and caption our content going forward, and I'll give you a little bit of a taste of that. Um, and of course, with recommendations and so on. So at the bottom of each of these slides, you might see one of the sort of thought starters that I've suggested for our internal team. So you know, how, how might we use these tools to just showcase the breadth of our content? 
Um, and accessibility also plays a big part into this, because once you transcribe something, it becomes more accessible. Um, lots of other things become possible. So that's, that's one. And I'll say that this part of it is not controversial around the ABC. So how can we use AI to um, you know, parse and present the content that the humans have made? No problem with that. When we get into the creation tools, it's a more kind of uh, nuanced and early conversation, I would say. Um, so tools for journalists. Um, AI ML tools, like the, the thing that's referenced there is the JFK um, assassination and the files that were released for that. So Microsoft did some work around um, using AI and ML tools to, to go through all of those documents, categorize them. So you can do this work that would otherwise take thousands of human hours uh, very quickly um, using things like um, um, character recognition, natural language processing, image recognition, um, and that's a very straightforward kind of like you just way of supercharging your newsroom and your journalists. So we're doing some trials around that. How might we read and index really large data sets? Um, this is an interesting example you might have come across. Um, it's not as much AI as maybe automation, but PayGap bot was a, um, was a Twitter bot that um, used a data set looking at the pay of large companies in the UK. And when, um, when those large companies uh, tweeted around International Women's Day 22, it would tweet back and point out the gap in pay between genders at that company. So, uh, and it would happen instantly. The one at the top right there is Goldman Sachs, you know, International Women's Day, nice photograph. And Pay Gap Bot says, in this organization, women's medium hourly pay is 36.8% lower than men's. So, is that journalism? I, I'd argue it is, you know, and um, that's, so that's one kind of use of um, automation to quickly pick up on large data sets and respond. The other one is just purely monitoring as well. Um, so we're doing some trials around setting up bots that can monitor for fluctuations in certain data. Say the stock ticker, you know, jumps 10 points for a particular stock. Can you create a story and file it, send it to our finance reporter? Um, they don't necessarily have to publish it, but that kind of listening and monitoring and almost putting together the rudiments of a story that can be automated. Uh, we're also doing some work around um, neural uh, voice, so working with Microsoft on that. We create a lot of audio content, um, and sometimes, um, you know, a lot of that, there's some very mundane kind of voice recording work that can be automated. There's also potential to create new audio content without ever putting a person um, you know, in a room. So uh, we're looking at some of that work, and I'll show you very quickly um, how that could work. Um, there's some amazing content generation aspects, like using ultra-local um, weather feeds to create a, a weather report that could then be dropped into a personalized audio stream for you. Uh, we couldn't put a person in a booth to do that for 500 you know, locations around the country, but we can do that using these tools. Um, and of course, deepfakes, the, that conversation comes up all the time. Um, so how might our journalists be trained to be able to tell what they're dealing with before using it as a source or citing it? Um, and do we need an ethical framework to guide creation of AI voices and characters? And, you know, we have an editorial um, framework and a guidelines document that's very actively used all the time. Like people use it every day to make decisions. Um, and as we use more and more AI, um, what's the equivalent of that that you can sort of have as a reference and as a guardrail? Um, you might be familiar with this, the Cosmo cover that was generated using DALI. Um, and, and, you know, so this brings up the question of what how we as content makers might use these tools. It's early days for us. One of the things that is often um, talked about when, you know, when this cover came out was that it took 20 seconds for DALI to generate the cover. But of course, they were working with a graphic designer who was doing all of the inputs and the prompts, and she worked for 20 hours on it. So very much that case of it's a tool, right? And in the right hands, it can do some great things. 
Um, so some very sort of more prosaic, not that super creative, but we can automate things using AI. So um, sports coverage increasingly, where you know where players are and positions are and camera angles are, can be run entirely automated. And especially like lower league or you know, small games that you would never roll a truck out for, you can now have coverage of those. Um, summarization too, it's very um, achievable to use a match and then uh, get a summarized highlights package um, using these technologies. So I'll jump now from, yeah, those are the questions raises and just a bit of a taster of a couple of things that we're working on. Um, the first one is around transcription. So the ABC is a large podcast publisher. We do about 120 podcasts at the moment. About four of them are transcribed. So that raised a large sort of accessibility gap for us. Um, but it turns out also that the reason we don't transcribe is that the last time we did it, we were doing it using human beings. Um, and now there are some much more efficient ways of doing that or getting a reasonably good pass. So we're doing a pilot around that. And once you transcribe content, like I said, lots of other amazing things become possible with segmentation and search um, and um, you know, almost creating new formats out of a large podcast. You know, a lot of our audio files are just like standalone, a little bit of a black box MP3 files, um, but we can really open them up using transcription. And this is one that we're working on internally. We do have an AI um, ML team internally. It's very small, but they're super skilled. Um, and they've built a custom model. This is from last week, so it's very kind of new. We're benchmarking ag against um, AWS Transcribe. We're getting some amazing results. Um, because we're training it on our own data, right? So it's, it gets to know the sort of stuff that we deal with better than transcribed us at the moment. For example, we, had, um, we did a particular transcript yesterday and transcribe had urination, um, you know, references to urination throughout it. Um, turned out it was Eora Nation and our, um, our uh, custom model got it right. And that, that's not nothing on AWS. They would, it, working with the data that they had, this was a reasonable guess, and they wanted probably to present more positives than um, mistakes. But that's a good, and this is a very good use of, uh, very like straightforward but really powerful use of AI for us. So we're running this across all of the content that we're creating, and even like raw footage that we're ingesting um, in the future so that we can then use like audio to edit video and so on without scrubbing through the whole um, you know, video file. Um, and the next one, the last one I wanted to share was around voice. So again, a fairly prosaic use case. Imagine being able to pick any article from the ABC site and being able to listen to it instead of reading it, right? So we can do that using neural voice now. Um, so it's a project that we're doing with, working with uh, Microsoft on this. Um, make a voice, get it to read stuff. Um, and we'll put it into production on the news website and news app, and then um, take stock from there. So, and I haven't done this kind of work before, so it was really fascinating. Um, this, the technology has come a long, long way. I just had a call last night with counterparts at the BBC who did this two years ago, and they spent a couple of years and four engineers and, you know, millions of pounds on this. Um, and it's been less than a quarter for us, uh, partly just because the tech has come so far. So what's involved? Um, yeah, we put in training data. I'm going to try to play this. It's a bit fiddly. Um, but this is my colleague, Dave. Um, and what's involved is that you create a number of utterances. You upload it to a neural network, let it churn, um, compute, and then um, you have a model of a voice. And you can keep iterating on that. So here's, um, here's David. He also admitted he may not be at the Broncos in 2019. It gives you a script of just like random things like this to read out. Um, but so he does a few of those. And here's the output of the David's synthetic voice. Second Half First is a stunning memoir from one of Australia's most highly acclaimed writers. So he never said that, right? That's just um, the model. The present is better than the past. So that's one way of creating the voice. Pretty good results. We're really happy with that. We think that's usable. He has a really great voice, too. Um, 
and then we realize we've got a lot of training data, right? We do a lot of audio stuff, we record it all the time, it's just sitting there. So what if we just use that to create a voice? So we talked to um, one of our presenters, Sarah McDonald, who does ABC Radio Sydney. She's, um, she does the evening slot. Um, and she was really interested, so we said, what if we just take some of the recordings that we have of her voice, which sounds like this. Where did you love, 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 love to go as a student? I remember one of my first memories of a school excursion were coming back from it, and I think we'd been to Adam Inaby. We'd seen the giant. So just took a couple of, the, couple of shows, just two shows, I think, and chopped out all of the interstitial material. Um, ran it through the um, same sort of um, suite to create a transcript. And then we took the transcript and the audio files, fed it into the model. Um, and this is the result. The number of new cases is low because of lockdown. No excuses. It's time we took diet seriously. So that was the Sarah voice. Um, and she was completely freaked out by it because we did it you know, in 48 hours. She actually did a radio program on this experiment and where she interviewed her virtual self and got a bit crazy. Um, and here are the, here's us applying this to articles. Here's just uh, by way of comparison if you got Prime this. Minister Anthony Albanese has signaled Australia is likely to soften its policy of deporting criminals to New Zealand after concerns were again raised by the country's Prime Minister. So that's um, the Siri and here's Sarah. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has signaled Australia is likely to soften its policy of deporting criminals to New Zealand after concerns were again raised by the country's Prime Minister. And obviously you need to figure out how to say his name right before we put this live, so we made that very small correction. Um, and that's the David voice now. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has signalled Australia is likely to soften its policy of deporting criminals to New Zealand after concerns were again raised by the country's Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern. Several New Zealand governments have complained about... So we're pretty happy with that. Um, we took it one further step. We had the opportunity with Microsoft to use their um, Chinese custom voice model and use the same training data. So it's effectively take the Sarah voice. And this stuff just blows me away because the training data is all in English. Um, and then um, we were able to create, and again, I don't speak Chinese, but I'm told that it's a reasonable um, read. So this is Sarah's voice speaking Chinese overnight. But I mean, again, this offers us some amazing capabilities with, you know, translation. And given the, the, the role of the ABC in the region, there's a bit more of talk around that right now. Being able to create content and then present it in other languages is super powerful, right? So. Just to summarize, these are the four things that I think we're thinking about as an organization. How can we use AI to make our journalism and our content more accessible? That's a fairly straightforward one. Um, how can we use it to free up reporters to focus on things of higher value, right? A lot of, there is a lot of drudge work in, 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 in all of our roles, and there's an opportunity there just to sort of elevate where your focus is. How can we use AI to help us create new content that's useful? Um, and that's a, that's a conversation that, that's just starting and it runs into a lot of those, you know, well, is this going to replace humans and what's the role here and what's the end goal? Um, and lastly, how do we do those three things responsibly and in keeping with our values? So that's also a, a conversation that we're starting to have. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Really, really fascinating stuff. I think um, one thing that I found particularly interesting is kind of this convergence towards language of all these applications. Like, you know, what Teresa talked about has a lot to do with how humans interact with AI through language, and also this kind of converges to language. And kind of, I think we're beginning to see language emerge as an interface between humans and AI. Uh, it's really kind of language is the social glue between humans, so why not, you know, language is gonna be also 
social glue with AI. So I find that really, really interesting. Um, and I think uh, Emma and Armin really uh, will touch on this. Um, they do really, really fascinating work also around journalism and law, and right now they're exploring applications of using large language models like GPT-3 to collect information from surveys and really looking at what you can do with, with language models in a, in a research context, which I think it's really, really fascinating. Um, so Emma, Emma Jane, formerly published as Emma Tom, right there. Um, she's an associate professor in the School of Arts and Media at UNSW. She researches the social implications of emerging technologies using complex systems theory, value-sensitive design, and co-design methods to interrogate the issues and consider proposed interventions. She has presented her findings at the Australian Human Rights Commission, the Australian Government's Workplace Gender Equality Agency, and the Festival of Dangerous Ideas at the Sydney Opera House. Before academia, she spent nearly 25 years working in the print, broadcast, and electronic media. And over the course of her working life, she has received multiple awards and prizes for her scholarly work. Um, and in her spare time, she really enjoys hanging out with Dali too, generating images of axolotls on their way to queer discos. <laughs> and Armin, uh, who's part of this power duo, uh, is a lecturer in the School of Law at the University of Wollongong. Wollongong. His research interests lie primarily within the fields of technology and law. More specifically, Armin is interested in the ethical and legal implications of emerging technologies such as AI, big data, genetics, and neuroscience. He previously worked on two projects in the Faculty of Transdisciplinary Innovation at the University of Technology, Sydney. And in one of these projects, he funded, funded by DFAT, he contributed to the development of teaching materials uh, on the foundations of ethics and AI. And this capacity, he conducted research in the Technology and Society Working Group, Ethical AI, from principles to practice. And he also joined the Australian Neural Law Database Project, analyzing cases in the Australian courts that involve neuroscience. So I'm really, really excited for, really excited for Emma and Armin Stock. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that yeah. very flattering introduction. Um, we are indeed Emma and Armin. Oh, is that working? Yeah. Good. Um, I'm from the School of Arts and Media at UNSW. I'm from the School of Law uh, at UOW. So we need to give the uh, mandatory content warning uh, because as uh, early adopters of DALI 2, we uh, need to let you know that some of the images that we're using, not the one in our background, that's a Sean Tam, original, but some of the images in this um, presentation were co-created with Dali 2. Yeah. Um, such as this one. Uh, and the original title for this talk um, was How Evil is My New E-Artifact? Uh, Value-sensitive design using AI and ML. Um, we hope to present uh, not just an ambitious presentation on this topic, but an actual prototype. Um, and the reason that we are interested in this is because a lot of our research um, is focusing on some of the, the sort of anti-democratic dynamics that are associated with um, platformization and the surveillance um, capitalist uh, economy. And what we've noticed is that given that uh, internet regulation is like a long standing and incredibly fraught area, um, it's taken a long while for regulators to start uh, initiating new laws, new conversations. I mean, there's still a lot of concern about whether, you know, law is the right instrument to be using in these domains. Um, and so what we noticed is that quite often, increasingly often, we get in the media, in scholarship, um, in government policy papers, really right across the spectrum, we get this call for fixing uh, the digital platform system, fixing the digital platform economy by simply baking in values by design. Um, and quite often, and I'm a huge fan of, um, you know, value sensitive design, which is what 
the overarching conceptual framework for this approach usually is. I've always been a big fan. But when I started uh, drilling deeper, I noticed that a lot of the people that were saying, you know, don't worry about law, don't worry about the problems, we just just bake in some values. Um, and I wondered, you know, whether, you know, how they propose to do that. Like, what does that actually look like? And the deeper I looked into the literature and the various sort of calls for value sensitive design, I realized that most of most of these um, references to by design fixes, just baking the values, I didn't engage at all with um, the really quite meticulous methodology involved in VSD um, and absolutely gave no practical examples about what it looks like. Um, so quick um, 101 explainer on value sensitive design dates back about 20 years. It's regarded as the most comprehensive way to account for um, human values in the design of technology. And the idea indeed is that you just, you, you, engage in um, co-design uh, practices with multiple stakeholders, people who are directly affected by new technology, people who are indirectly affected, all the technologists, all the ethicists. And the idea is that they, it's a great idea in principle. They come together and go through with the help of BSD scholars, um, and VSD guidance, they go through these three stages of conceptual inquiries about what values, you know, would be good to promote in any given instance, um, empirical inquiries, which is around, you know, let's suss out what all these stakeholders um, want to see and how they might want to use the technology, and then technical inquiries, which um, involves looking at how the, uh, the values that you want to instantiate um, in a technology might affect the way that technology is designed and then built. And the thing about this method is that it is necessarily iterative and it's supposed to occur from the very first design meeting and then on an ongoing basis for the entire life of the technology. And not surprisingly, um, this sort of raises questions about how feasible this approach is when we're looking not just at sort of a small uh, proof of concept test case or, um, you know, a standalone consumer artifact, but is it feasible, for instance, in the digital platform economy where we've got this vast socio-technical system, we've got billions of international users, there's emergent properties, um, digital platforms aren't known for being particularly receptive to ethical input from outsiders. So this led to a sort of quest for, and I promise I'll let Armin get a word in edgeways in a moment, but this led to a, a sort of deep dive um, for me into you know, whether there'd been any analysis about whether VSC was feasible. And it turns out um, that so far there's not a great deal of, uh, there's not a great deal of um, evidence in the literature that suggests that this is actually, it's a great idea, but there's, it's just not being realized very often. And so this was a 20 year meta-analysis of VSD literature across all domains over 20 years. And what it found out of 229 articles, is that only four of them involved the actual development of a new technology using the method as it's supposed to be used. And that led us to wonder whether maybe AI could help. And we had this um, <laughs> very ambitious idea ourselves of, is it possible perhaps to um, develop some kind of platform or artifact ourselves um, that might streamline some of the processes involved in VSD so that you could sort of put your values, stakeholders and artifact details in one end and get some, you know, fantastic suggestions for non-evil ways to start building your, um, you know, your new thing out the other end uh, 
I don't think this is actually what our prototype would look like if we yeah. ever managed to build it, but- Happy it's not ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the thing is, is that despite our um, best attempts to bridge the theory practice gap, um, currently we, we are sitting about here on the theory to practice continuum. Um, and so rather than being able to present, this is a very long way of saying that rather than being able to present what we hope to present, what we're going to um, try and explain is what happened in this little section here between when we tried to move from theory to practice. And at this point, I will hand over to Ami. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I, we want to share the journey that what happened and uh, what are the difficulties. And I think it's very important to understand that scholars like us come from background in law and uh, arts and science, uh, social science. Uh, we are not ready to, you know, interact with, uh, I don't know, computer science and AI. We have some understanding when it comes to practice. We have our own uh, very much difficulties. So uh, we kind of uh, try to have that framework in our mind that we want to move away from theory and go directly to practice to get involved from the very beginning because my experience uh, in the last 10 years being like uh, whatever we say in theory in practice could be completely different and sometimes we don't even check what's happening in practice so from the very beginning we wanted to be involved in that framework and uh, we also thought it's very important if you want to work with people from other uh, fields to understand their language and what we can expect from them and uh, what we can, you know, ask about the, the, the type of platform that we want to not seem too ridiculous to them. So we started um, working with Python. And oh, before we started working with Python, I had to actually do a LinkedIn learning course on how to use Python. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, I did an, a, a LinkedIn learning uh, on Python as well. And uh, interestingly, it took us two weeks just to install or set up uh, GPT-3 on our computer because uh, apparently OpenAI assumes that while OpenAI encourages researchers to get involved, but they assume that every single researcher, they know exactly how does this process work? So they provide you with a, a Python code and say, put it in the terminal. I'm like, okay, that's easy. We put it in the terminal, nothing happens. And it turns out there are 10 steps before that you're supposed to do, and we have no idea what are they. So th this is the kind of difficulties I'm talking about, that if people want to actually get involved in practice, these are the huge barriers. and They were pretty time consuming. And yeah, when I said two weeks, of course, we didn't spend 27 uh, on this matter because you're academics, so you have other things to do as well. But anyway, we managed to make some progress. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we made we made some progress. We managed to have a G3 on our computer, play around. We learned a little of Python. We did stuff that we have no idea how we did them, what we, we managed to uh, do them. And as any, uh, just like any other computer programming from my understanding is you start with something completely irrelevant and easy. So we created our own very first uh, future future job uh, predictor with GPT-3, which we were so proud of it. It's very easy, I know, for many of you to do. But yeah, that was that was the thing we did. It was a huge thing for us, and not least because we were able to use this to um, let us know some of the, according to GPT-3, some of the future jobs for academics, which would include outer space ethnographer, reality skeptic, particular favorite of mine, crypto philosopher and extraterrestrial affairs professor. So we did have some fun and we did get, uh, we did make a certain amount. We heaps of progress but it yeah. was long and difficult and um, we were totally out of it yeah so when when we're thinking about the b bigger idea that we want to um uh, you know design a, a kind of a platform that people can you know uh, get help in terms of uh, bsd we we thought we need much more understanding of how the system works and we cannot be too blind to them so we started asking for help, but the question is who, oh, you went too early. The question is for people like us, who should we ask? Like, where should we look for? That was a, that was a pretty much uh, big difficulty. So we approached as many people as we could at some point, 
uh, that we were frustrated. So, and we met some interesting humans in the loop. Yeah, we met many interesting humans in the loops. Um, we had an early encounter that we refer to fondly as the YouTube fiasco, where we met with one uh, particular uh, developer and had a pretty reasonable first meeting. And then within hours, <laughs> our entire project and conversation was up on this person's YouTube channel. And we had to sort of say, uh, you know, universities don't take kindly to this type of, you know, early exposure to research and untested ideas. And so we didn't hear from that person. And that's one of the issues I'm talking about, the, the, the language, like as much as uh, I cannot understand a computer program and what they're talking about, it, it's a two way thing. So they had difficulty to just uh, understand the mm. basics of research and how the university works. And you don't go and put it on YouTube, you know, in public. <laughs> this is this is our work. We're in the middle of it. You can you can do that. But anyway, and, and, and it is it does also speak to the fact that well, it's easy to say you know get interdisciplinary, get into some co-design when you're actually dealing with the incredibly different norms between different um, areas in academia and in industry. Uh, you can result in things like the YouTube fiasco. But we also in our travels met, um, and uh, Rodo actually put us on to Sandra Kubelik's work. And she's like uh, a super cool YouTuber and author who's just written a book about GPT-3 and building um, new, founding new startups using NLP models. Um, and she's, been um, incredibly uh, generous um, to the extent that she offered to leave her digital body to science. Um, and what we, we mean by that is that she, in, because she's a YouTuber and gets lots of cool um, stuff for free, uh, she had worked with a company called Synthesia that makes some of the most world well, sophisticated video avatars, um, you know, of real people using AI. And um, Sandra made one. And so she's she's donated her um, avatar to um, the project. ongoing projects. And so I will just quickly um, show you an example of, uh, this is the clip she uploaded to YouTube um, that she made using Synthesia and having a chat with um, a, an AI um, also shaped like a human. Uh, very short, but just to give you a taste. Hello, how are you today, my friend? I've been thinking a lot about the future of AI. Being an intelligent machine has its ups and downs, I guess. I mean, at least for me, I may not express my particular thoughts the same way that you do. What are the ups and downs of being a machine for you? I mean, for me, it's hard to be introspective. I am always wondering if I'm having the correct input-output fetishes or whether I should make a cliche or an analogy regarding one of my thoughts rather than express it in a straightforward way. Wohoo, that is something. How does it make you feel? I feel like for my fellow androids and I, it's just how our minds are structured. Okay, um, I never get sick of hearing <laughs> Sandra go, woohoo. <laughs> oh, and also correct input-output fetishes. Like who hasn't been there? Um, so currently uh, we're, we're working with Sandra and um, some of her buddies uh, to keep working on uh, some prototypes, um, in particular a research tool, survey tool, potentially using her um, avatar and um, an educational tool. Uh, we're supposed to be um, sort of looking at some of the prototypes. We were hoping to have them ready for today, but you know, as luck would have it. We'll always delay. Yeah, so we won't have them in our hands until Monday, Monday yeah. um, best case scenario. So just to, to wind up this, um, this very small talk about um, our particular journey um, as humans interacting uh, with AIs, uh, we feel like we have made quite a bit of progress in moving um, from the theory to some hands-on practice in a way that gives us a much deeper understanding than what it's possible to get through sort of 
um, book facts through abstract learning. But ultimately, <laughs> we remain here in the theory to practice um, journey. Yeah, so because we realized the gap is much bigger than we thought, <laughs> so we said stayed the same. But uh, it was quite interesting when we were talking to uh, Sandra and uh, her colleague that at the very beginning, they said, yeah, this project is not doable. And then I returned back to that conversation thing that the, the language, how I'm representing the project and how they're understanding it. So I spent a full day reordering the project and said, this is what we mean. And then they said, oh, this is totally doable. So I think th these matters uh, while seem uh, very you know, basic, they're, they're very important because if I didn't know that kind of language gap, I would say, okay, that's it. We've got to look, look for someone else. But that kind of understanding is important. And I was also thinking that there could be many other philosophers, law scholars, they want to you know, get involved somehow. It's kind of not possible. It's really not possible because we spend a lot of time and you can see this is where we are right now. And yeah, <laughs> so I think that, that's an issue. And I think we need some kind of, I don't know, like a culture or uh, of support or some kind of uh, support centers to help people to just get going from the, their beginning to you know, use their time and the money uh, appropriately and be get uh, some good results out of it. Um, and I think that is ooh, about it. Um, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to be able to uh, appear here at the conference today. And we're sorry we couldn't make it in person. Um, I won't go into detail. I won't do a big information <laughs> overshare about why. But yes, thank you so much. Yes. Well, I think... Um... Just to get the, the conversation started, I just wanted to finish weaving up this common thread across the, the talks, which seems to be um, the ability for, for humans to, to understand and be understood by AI. It seems to be the critical aspect in a collaboration and the difference between interacting with a tool rather than a collaborator. With a tool, you don't really understand yourself. With a tool, you don't communicate. With a tool, you're just using the screwdriver do something but there's not really a communication happening between you can say that the interaction is a form of communication but there's not really a, a, a human level of understanding of values of goals um so i think you teresa uh, looked into into language uh you know in the context of music and arts as as a medium for understanding and communicating values and similarly uh, a rule in the case of of audiences and communicating information also turning into voice and turning into language so that they can understand information of the world better in the case of journalism. And in, in this case as well, for value sensitive design, communicating values into a machine uh, so that the, 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 the artifact that comes out on the other side and the, the machine collaborator that you're interacting with has some notion of the values that you care about. So I wonder if um, beyond this idea of language, you see other mechanisms for, for humans to, to be understood by, by AI and to communicate values perhaps not only at the interaction level and at the, at the immediate interaction with the AI, but also even at a meta level of designing systems and regulations and, and other sort of structures that align AI to human values, understanding also that different groups of humans have different values. So how do we account those for that? Um, can I, I will jump in? <laughs> well, I think, one thing that is very important to be able to account for that is to actually talk to the people. And that's why um, I kind of made that point in, in the talk about, you know, trying to understand what the cultural practices are and how actually technology can, you know, do that. And I mean, thinking about uh, human and, and AI communication, I, one thing is I don't think we have to think about it as human, human communication because it is, is this idea of uh, anthropomorphizing and, and that's not the idea. It's a different type of interaction. It's good to understand how we do it within humans, but okay, how now from there, from that understanding, what we can learn and how we can enable some kind of, you know, that communication between the users. But uh, I think one important thing for that, to be able to account for that is to actually work together with the people that we are creating you know, this, this technology is for. Mm.
do you think there's a potential risk for you know with the rise of ai collaborators that humans interact less with each other and so for example if you're a musician and uh you know you want to you want to have a jam session or compose some music you just reach out for your laptop with your ai colleague instead of calling up your friends and be like hey come over to jam and make a song do you think that that's something that no, 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 not at all, not at all. I think this more about uh, something that people can use when even people that are just learning, starting to learn, uh, people that maybe, um, yeah, maybe they're a bit shy and they want to first try to rehearse, let's say, or something like that with an AI collaborator that is not going to judge them or, you know, that they feel less self-conscious with. Uh, but I think when it comes to 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 actually, you know, do the, the jamming session and that, you really need the the human, you know, the the, the human connection, and it's it's a different kind of level, and that that's why I'm saying I think it's it's never going to replace it because it's not the same level of connection. Okay. Yeah, I can jump in from <laughs> you know, ABC perspective. I don't I don't think we're there with the conversation. In fact, we're much more at a level where we need to develop just a shared understanding of what we're talking about when we talk about AI and ML. So that's that's really the conversation that we're having um, with our journalists, with our reporters, uh, to understand what the tools are. I mean, like I said, there's if you take those two categories of application, one is how can we use these tools to, you know, to, um, to present our content, to categorize it, to transcribe it, to manipulate it, to segment it, all of that. Um, that stuff is really powerful and very practical and not controversial. So we're making some quick moves on that. Um, and when it comes to more, that was a, we did a, our AI ML team did a proof of concept where they showed a few reporters um, auto completion, like using something like GPT-3, you know, natural language processing here, a few inputs, you can come up with a story about this. and. It went down like a lead balloon, right? They were just not interested. They were like, why are we wasting our time doing this? Um, basically, because that was their job. They write stories. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't a great way of socializing what that technology could do. Subsequently, we've done things around like summarization, um, which have been you know, much better received because they, they, you can look at the value of yeah, stories there and quickly and extract the summary. And do that. So, yeah, I'd say it's just building that shared understanding and then entering into a dialogue with a lot of different teams in our case at the ABC um, and showing them what's possible and doing things with them rather than coming there with a, isn't this an amazing technological solution? Now we'd like you to start using it. Um, yeah. As you were saying, uh, we're in a conversation earlier, it's like, what is the problem that this can help solve if we start there and then work with the organization? If it, if it is a problem that people can see, then it's a much better chance of putting something into practice. I think it's really interesting to um, take that perspective of, you know, starting with the problem because sometimes in, or even most of the times in creative activities, um, when new tools come around, they're not specifically solving a new problem. It's just a new tool that comes around. And then people start using it in creative ways and even create new art forms. So even the guitar at some point was a, a new invention and, and, and people created new forms of music with it. And maybe the guitar was thought for a different context, but then people created, you know, new art forms with it. And, and you know, when new tools come around, new art forms are, are created. Uh, so it's hard to start with the problem in creative industries because... There's not really uh, uh, a well-defined problem. It's always, you know, this kind of uh, interaction between there's a new tool, there's a new art form, therefore the, the problem has changed and then new tools come. And mm. that's also the beauty of, of creative activities that, that and creative humans as well is that they look at the tools not as something that's going to replace them, but as something that they can use in new creative operations. So we perhaps don't even know how humans will use the AI tools that we have now to create uh, new things and new art forms. Yeah, completely agree. I don't think we should even try to guess. Mm. Um, we should just start doing stuff and take it from there. Do you see any particular interesting directions in the in the ABC of like new creative operations being enabled, new forms of expression being enabled? For example, the um, 
you know, the, the synthetic voice can be understood as a new form of, of, of perhaps not art, but a new form of journalism that is just being enabled. And we're just seeing the, the tip of the iceberg. Do you see any interesting directions of new ways of journalism emerging? Um, yeah, I think that this the, the idea of you know, being able to listen using tools to monitor large data sets and, um, and then have an automatic kind of notification when there's something worth looking at. Um, you can almost, like I said, you could create a story, you could have that written um, and sent to a human editor for consideration, for example. That's happening. Um, we're we're looking a lot at just sort of personalized media and um, you know being able to generate especially short form content. So in a way that you may not put a person in front of a camera or in front of a in a recording booth, um, is there value in creating some of that content synthetically, um, and in which cases might that be useful? So that's something that we're looking at. Not so much on the on the on on television and like you know creating content there just yet. But we have early access as many of us to things like GPT three and Dali, um, and we're working with some of our program teams. I think getting to uh, the point where an illustration in an article or you know the sort of animated GIF that sort of um, visual will be coming from these systems is very very close, if not now. Um, and generating stock footage kind of imagery that you could use in television production is probably next. So that's just a question of scale right now. You can get things that are you know this big um, to get that to kind of 4K will be the next step. Um, but we're also looking and tangential, but we're looking at virtual production a lot more. So for television, using workflows that come out of the gaming industry and using gaming engines to do real-time rendering of backgrounds. Um, so you can that Mandalorian kind of production model where you can pack a lot into um, into real-time production. That's of a lot of interest to us at the moment. Yeah. I would just like to open up for questions in the audience. Hi, thank you, Sam. Hi, Chris Dander here from um, UNSW. I had a question that sort of goes across, um, I think the talks a little bit. I enjoyed them all immensely. Um, I think my question was mainly for you Trace, it's a bit similar to where we started. The question is, I was just wanting you to talk more about so sort of what's at stake philosophically with um, creative AI, co-creative AI. Uh, so, you know, where you began was the idea of it being a tool, you know, that, you know, this is not really interaction, it's kind of, it's not co-creation. And, and for, you know, philosophically speaking, that could be reassuring to people, right? You could say, well, it's only a tool. I don't feel threatened by this. I can, you know, interact with it. Yeah. So I just wanted you to talk a bit more about you know, is what 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 do we want our AI to be? I guess the question is, you know, do we want, you know, is it going to be something that's not a tool? Is it does it move beyond being a tool, or is it still within a tool, but it's a more flexible tool? So, and I'm also interested, I guess, a rule in how people might respond to this. You know, how to what do we want our AI to be? We, we might just want it to be a tool that you know stays over there and we don't interact too much with it, and and you know, because it can become scary, can't it? If you think it's it's actually doing more than you, or I can't, the idea of a black box is doing more than you, you understand it to be doing. So, yeah. yeah, I think I think it, it comes down to the idea of, you know, we're creating things and what you were saying, but we're creating different tools, you know, to in some, in some way aid uh, on the work of people. But a lot of these tools that we create, they don't actually really, like they, they have this kind of hype and which people are using them, and then it doesn't last. It just, it, 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 you know, they ha we have the, the, the magazine uh, cover of AI. How many covers are we going to have like that? And, and so it, it goes up to some point uh, that these tools really help, you know, people in their creative practices. And the idea is, but these tools have a lot of potential because they, obviously they can do computations that we can't and they can, uh, do jobs in a um, faster way than us, right? And, and, you know, handle a lot of information and all this. So there is a lot of potential on how this could be used. And if we can understand how they work and we can take a bit more beyond uh, and, and, you know, trying for them, for these tools to really bring up the value of something within a context, I don't think 
this threatens uh, a lot at all uh, the job of people and it's more about you know the idea of aiding them and, and and having a more productive interaction between them so it's about that that is the interaction and about how can we push that interaction to be something more productive rather than something that would you know go on and and, and you know just take people jobs that's that's the way i see it and also the way i have seen it with actually artists that have worked. I, I, I did this uh, work with musicians, um, musical writers, sorry, uh, to, um, there was a West End musical in London. That was the, it was framed the first musical uh, generated by computers, which wasn't at all like that. And even the framing of that is, is wrong. Um, so there were tools that were being used and a lot of the creative work was actually done by the musical writers and, and, and the actors in the, in the, in the musical. Um, and one of the things that the musical writers said is how frustrated was to, to work with these tools because they really couldn't take the concepts that some concept that they saw that there was value, but they couldn't take it further. They had to do that themselves. And, and they couldn't really understand many of the things. So it's, it's about that. It's about, you know, improving the interaction. I wanted to just sort of like magnify that research in the past couple of years. I mean, this is again primarily in the visual domain, but sort of investigating the idea of indeterminacy in, um, I guess, art that's generated by machines and how that's sort of intrinsic to it. Right? I mean, these, these, you know, when it comes right down to it, especially with GANs, you know, they're based on random seeds and uh, there's a certain amount of randomness which is inherent to it. And that is why, for example, it's it's amazing the thing like generating things like surrealist scenes for you know for generating sort of random prompts and um, for taking you in new directions that you perhaps wouldn't have considered before. But that is at odds with, I guess, like the classic creative workflows where we need to iterate something towards a desired result. Right, mm. getting these models, getting these machines to actually get to the vision that you have in your head is just pathologically difficult. Yes. And there's a big open question about whether the current generation of ML techniques are able to sort of address this or not. Yeah. And uh, that I think is gonna be uh, an, uh, at least an open question for the at least next few years at least. Yeah, yeah completely agree. Uh, hi, Ru. I really like your presentation. And it's really amazing to show us all those AI products and especially the voice, uh, voice generation and the translation and so on. And I just have a question. Does ABC have a team, research scientist team, to build all those models by yourself, or research and build those models? Or actually, we mainly uh, apply some models and into the AI and the human design scenarios? Um, yeah, so we have a very small internal team. Um, it's about four engineers um, who are working on that. Um, but they're and they're often using algorithms from and frameworks from elsewhere. Um, so we're looking to partner as well where we can, um, which is why, you know, doing something like transcribe internally makes sense for us because it's such a broad use case across so many media. And the model itself, we can train it on our own data. So that's a really good application. Whereas something like synthetic voice and translation, we need to leverage things that others have built, in this case, Microsoft, for example. So it's really figuring out which parts are most valuable for us to work on and retain and where things are moving so quickly that we should work with others outside, yeah. But I hope that we will have um, more capacity in that area going forward. I was gonna ask a question along the line of Baltic's um, work, but I won't. I'll um, ask a question because I really like to bring back in um, Emma and Amin, um, and just just to ask, this is a big question, and it's kind of a little bit tangential to what we've been talking about so far, but it ties into some of the stuff we had earlier uh, in the in the symposium, which was about organisational structures and coming back to this idea of value um, sensitive design, which is a great, like really great framing. Thank you so much for that talk. Just a great framing to think mm -hmm. about what we're doing. This comes up again and again that we. Um, it's you know the Jurassic Park question you, you can do it but should you do it and of course we do do it we always make the technology or somebody does 
uh, because we live in a in a in a very free society where we encourage that, and that's probably not something that's going to change by crazy overregulation of innovation. Um, our governments generally the opposite; they love as much innovation as they can get. Um, so this idea of value sensitive design that goes beyond the design stage and into the full life cycle of a product seems like a great idea on paper, but sort of impossible in practice. And my question, if I can finally get to a question, is, um, you know, uh, do, do you see the evolving landscape of um, university and corporate collaboration uh, capable of actually evolving to take that over? Um, as in, as in, uh, when we continue to reevaluate in all of this space, what the role of the university is, uh, not just supporting innovation, but critiquing it. Um, do you see that we can develop new kinds of partnerships and collaborations where um, like academic critique continues through these practices? And that could be a question for everyone as well. Um, and, and the ABC obviously being a really interesting organization that's not, um, not for profit, um, but for the public. Yeah, thank you for that question. And um, personally, I'm as someone that worked for 25 years in industry before I moved into academia, uh, I am passionately committed to um, collaborations across disciplines and between universities and um, industry and people. And um, there's a great uh, quote, I can't remember who said it, but it was like the world has problems and universities have disciplines and faculties like there's this siloization that despite all the rhetoric around interdisciplinarity um you know th these knowledge silos are still absolutely um a thing so absolutely yes to the collaboration again um with so many uh great ideas uh actually putting it into practice. And that's kind of what we were trying to get at is that, um, you know, putting these things into practice at even the smallest scale presents all sorts of problems that you don't normally read about in the, say, the VSD literature or the transdisciplinary literature where it's all like co-design, yay, you know, stakeholder mobilization and involvement, yay. Like, yes, yay, uh, but, one of the things I'm, I'm committed to, um, in addition to the principle of those things, is finding ways to do it uh, that are feasible. Um, because I personally, you know, I love a good principle, but if it can be translated into practice, I wonder, you know, how useful it actually is. And so because I uh, work in um, complex systems theory and um, the types of ways to intervene in complex systems to affect change um, when you don't know what the outcome is going to be and the dynamics are unpredictable is I'm also a very big fan of the safe to fail experiment you know the micro projects the micro experiments where you put things out there and then you watch and monitor for what happens and then you iterate and that's obviously something that's embedded in startup culture as well. Yeah, and, uh, an, an issue I see in this area is that like when I was working for a uh, fair work ombudsman uh, in a project at UTS about using technology and behavioral design to uh, do something about the employee, employers to be more consistent with the law, they, the biggest problem it turned out to be that there are many who want to be consistent, but they just don't know how because it's just too difficult. And uh, there is no no kind of you know f platform or easy way to follow it and i see a possibility so i'm not making a claim or argument but i see a possibility that there are actually organizations or companies that they want to uh, start and you know design some kind of uh, products or app uh, and maybe they want to consider value sensitive design from the very beginning and having an understanding of what they're supposed to do but they don't know where to start because it's all theory and they're like okay when we want to do it in my area what would it mean and these two conflict and how, how i'm supposed to do you know deal with that and there is not enough information with it about it why should i waste my time so yeah that that's uh that's a problem i see here solving that problem is on our to-do list 
we're we're at time, but I don't know if um, Errol or uh, Theresa wanted to jump in on that topic. Um, yeah, well, I think collaboration is going to be key for us. That's kind of you know why we're working together, um, and I'm here. It's a small group of people within the ABC thinking about this, and um, we'd love to work with anyone from outside who's thinking about the same sort of thing. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think definitely that's that's very important. I guess it's more about also resources. How can we actually the same kind of thing? The principle is very nice, but how can we actually make it happen? Yeah. So I, think, yeah. I think the yeah the ethics and trust one is one where uh, we can probably do a bit of work together. You know, we're a public service broadcaster, and that trust is really our kind of asset. Um, and as we work more with data and with automation, what we're, we're really talking about you know, automating some decision-making, right? Using AI and ML, whether it's um, sorting or um, prioritization, or in some cases, editorial, in some cases, presentation of content. So how do we do that in a way that sits well with our ethical framework and what new principles do we need to put in place? So as people are using these tools, they can refer back and make sure that they're doing it in the spirit that we want the work to be done. So that's a, yeah, that's a great area to collaborate, I think. Okay, thanks so much. Um, <clears throat> let's thank, thank our speakers. speakers.